Good morning. Good to see you all here in the Lord's house on this beautiful Lord's day. <clears throat> Truly, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We want to welcome all of you out there in internet land on Facebook and YouTube to our services this morning. And again, we want to encourage you <clears throat> if you uh, get by our way here in New Troy, we would love to have you stop in and uh, worship with us live <clears throat> in Sunday morning at 11 a.m. And uh, we would look forward to fellowshipping with you and ministering to you. Uh, a few announcements. Um, this week, coming week, uh, I'll be gone Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday for mid-year meetings in Mansfield, Ohio. And because <clears throat> I'll be kind of pressed for time to prepare for a sermon for next Sunday, my uh, colleague, Pastor Ron Welsh, Reverend Ron Welsh, who is now teaching the adult Sunday school class, has graciously consented to preach the morning message uh, next Sunday. So uh, be something, something different. And uh, I'll be able to enjoy conference, the, the uh, mid-year meetings a little bit more, not having to worry about uh, the message Sunday morning. Anyway, um, next Sunday, following the morning service, we are planning a carry-in dinner, and uh, this is something we do uh, January, February, and March. We used to call them Energy Saving Sundays, but now that we're not having evening services anymore, <clears throat> that, that really doesn't fit. So we just all have a carry-in dinner and uh, have a good time together and go home. Now, in two weeks, we will be having an evening service, <clears throat> but it will be our special quarterly uh, three-fold communion service at six o'clock. So in two weeks on Sunday evening, we will be having our three-fold communion service at six o'clock. Some other re uh, prayer requests that we've been <clears throat> sharing with you and encouraging you to uh, uphold with us in prayer. Our dear brother Ike Graham, who pastors the Orville Grace Brethren Church, had to go through a quintuple a heart bypass surgery this past week. And the report says that he is doing fine. And uh, we pray that he will um, be restored to a full measure of health. Also, our dear sister Mindy Burns underwent uh, quite an extensive chemo treatment this past Friday. She now has three more to go. I uh, texted her this afternoon, or yesterday afternoon, and she said that she was okay, but she was really tired. I can believe that. Continue to uphold our sister Florence Casto in prayer. Uh, she recently had surgery for bladder cancer, and uh, hopefully they got it all this time. <clears throat> Continue to remember our dear sister, America Schmaltz and Carol Stuckey, Joy Smith, also our brother John White, uh, brother Curtis, and uh, Brent and Sherry Galaro, and Joe DeRossi. Also our other pastors we've been praying for, Pastor Peter Peer, who is now I believe begun his um, um, radiation treatments for cancer and Brother Chip Jones, the last I knew he was still in the hospital with, um, what do they call it? Um, anyway, it's, it's a heart failure problem. So keep those dear saints in your prayers, will you? All right. I can tell you our roof fund is now at 37.89 and uh, our goal is 30,000, so we're uh, a little over 10% there. We have uh, quite a ways to go and only a couple of months left before we're gonna have to cough up the money to have the roof redone. So 
any of you out there who could help us with that, we would certainly appreciate it. Just earmark your gift. Roof Fund, New Troy Grace Brethren Church, and send it to Box 67 uh, here in New Troy, Michigan, 49119. All right, that's enough of that. Let's have an opening word of prayer and we will get into the message this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you and praise you again for this Lord's Day. Truly, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Just uh, pray that your Holy Spirit right now would quiet our hearts and minds. Uh, hide me behind the cross, anoint our, my lips, anoint our ears and hearts, that the message that goes forth this morning will rule forth in the power and might of your Holy Spirit. Thus saith the Lord, we ask all these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Before I get into the message this morning, I have kind of a lengthy uh, story to share with you. Another one our brother Jim DePew put on. And uh, I hope uh, none of you ladies out there get offended. <clears throat> this is strictly fictitious. We're not trying to make any inferences in any way. There was an old hillbilly farmer who had a wife who just nagged him unmercifully. From morning till night, and sometimes later, she was always complaining about something. The only time he got any relief when he was out, when he was out plowing with his old mule. So he tried to plow a lot. One day when he was out plowing, plowing, plowing his wife brought him lunch in the field. He drove the old mule into the shade, sat down on a stump, and began to eat his lunch immediately. His wife began haranguing him again. Complain, complain, nag, nag. It just went on and on. All of a sudden, the old mule lashed out with both hind feet, caught her smack in the back of the head, and killed her dead on the spot. Well, at the funeral several days later, the minister noticed something rather odd. When a woman mourner would approach the old farmer, he would listen for a minute and nod his head in agreement. But when a man mourner approached him, he would listen for a minute, then shake his head in disagreement. This was so consistent, the minister decided to ask the old farmer about it. So after the funeral, the minister spoke to the old farmer and asked him why he nodded his head and agreed with the women, but always shook his head and disagreed with all the men. The old farmer said, well, the woman, women would come up and say something about how nice my wife looked or how pretty her dress was, so I'd nod my head in agreement. Well, what about the men, the minister asked. The old farmer replied, well, they wanted to know if the mule was for sale. Uh, sounds like some other men had some wives that uh, they weren't real happy with. All right, enough of that. Let's turn now in our Bibles and our swords to John's epistle of 2 John. And we're going to finish it up today. We're going to look at verses 10 and 11 and also 12 and 13, although we're not really going to expo ex exposit those verses very much. So if you have your swords, your Bibles, please turn with me to 2 John 9 through 11. And uh, we will... We will read, I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. All right. Excuse me, 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face 
so that your joy may be made full. The children of your chosen sister greet you. So John wraps up this epistle with these final words. First of all, we're going to continue where we were at last week. Last week we looked at fellowshipping with apostates is forbidden, the apostates to be recognized, the reward to be guarded, the doctrine to be retained. And today we're going to pick it up with the fellowship to be denied, verses 10 and 11. Well, last week in my sermon, I mentioned this famous Bible expositor from the 19th century, Albert Barnes. He's quite an eminent scholar and wrote these this, uh, commentaries on the Old and New Testament, about 15, 16 volumes. Well, this week I would like to quote from his commentary, volume 10, from his commentary about 2 John. And again, this is, this is somewhat of a lengthy quote, but bear with me. He says, it is our duty to be on guard against the arts of the teachers of error. He mentions them in verse 7. They abound in every age. They are often learned, eloquent, and profound. They study and understand the arts of persuasion. They adapt their instructions to the capacity of those whom they would lead astray. They flatter with vanity, accommodate themselves to their peculiar views and tastes, court to their society and seek to share their friendship. They often appear to be eminently meek and serious and devout and prayerful. For they know that no others can succeed who profess to inculcate the principles of religion. There are few arts more profound than that of leading men into error, few that are studied more or with greater success. Every Christian, therefore, should be on his guard against such arts. And while he should on all subjects be open to conviction and be ready to yield his own opinions when convinced that they are wrong, yet he should yield to truth, not to men, to argument, not to the influence of the personal character of the professed religious teachers." Unquote. Some very uh, astute words there from the late Albert Barnes. So against this fine analysis of the wiles of the apostate teachers, John has some words of wisdom to share with the chosen lady or elect lady that he writes to in this epistle and with us so that we can avoid being caught in their snares. The certainty of their coming is implied in verse 10, he said, if anyone comes to you. Now the Greek text here is so written that it implies that false teachers do come. It is no mere hypothesis. Furthermore, come implies that the coming is with a mission. Experience confirms the fact that false teachers do come, not once, but many times. So great is their persistence to propagating error. Now the danger from their coming is apparent. He continues in verse 10, he says, and does not bring this teaching. So he's, he's hinting here of, the, of uh, danger. It has been the characteristic of the 20th and 21st century Christians to be tolerant of those with whom they may disagree doctrinally. And herein lies the force for the union of many denominations into one organizational body, the compromise of doctrinal differences of supreme importance to vital Christianity, especially concerning the person of Christ. 
The result has been an outward form of godliness with an accompanying denial of its power. The danger from such attitudes and doctrinal denials about Christ cannot be overstated. Their deadening effect is apparent to every informed saint of God. You know, not too many years ago, we got some very distressful news that some of the churches of the, our old fellowship out in California had gone to the point not only of uh, denying the tenets of our ordinances of threefold communion and triune immersion, but some of them were even questioning the infallibility of the scriptures. Dr. Herman Hoyt warned years and years ago that when you step off that level plane of pre-millennial, pre-tribulationalism in our eschatology, he said, and start that downward trend, there's no stopping it until all eschatological truth is lost. And not just that, but then it bleeds over into deeper tenets, main pillars of the Christian faith the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, the substitutionary atonement of his death on the cross. And it just, it just there's no stopping it until all, all truth is, is just, it's gone. And we're seeing that happening today. So the instruction for their coming is explicit. John says, do not receive him into your house. Do not give him a greeting, for the one who gives a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Verses 10 and 11. You know, I, I just cannot agree with those who insist that John in this epistle was only giving instructions to a specific Christian household of the first century and not laying down a rule for Christians to follow in every century. His instruction is just as valid and applicable to us today as it was for the first century Christians when he wrote these words almost 2,000 years ago. If they weren't applicable to every age of Christians, God would not have saw to it that they were included in the canon of scripture if it was only to be applied to a certain church of that time. I mean, that's just utter nonsense. Whoever, come, whoever dreamed up that uh, is just not thinking very clearly. So if an apostate denying basic truth concerning the deity of Jesus Christ, and this is just one, one of the tenets of the, of the Christian faith, seeks audience with a member of one's household he is not to be received into the home or given the hand of fellowship in token of agreement with his false teaching. Because if you do that, it's exactly what you're saying. I'm in agreement with them. The expression participates in his evil deeds is synonymous with saying fellowshipping in his evil deeds. We must exercise great care so that no one may receive the impression that we condone or approve doctrinal error. Now there are many good Christian brothers and sisters that I know personally who do not agree with our stand on the ordinances. They, they have some variations of that. Now I cannot, I cannot, uh, we will not take them into our, our fellowship as far as members of our churches, but we can, we can fellowship with them uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ. But this is a far cry from someone who claims to be a believer and would deny the basic tenets of the Christian faith, the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, the infallibility of the scriptures. We understand where it's, it says, he says, all scripture is God breathed. It's all the very breath, the very words of God. 
So we cannot, we cannot in any way compromise on these basic tenets of the Christian faith or we are, we are participating in their evil deeds. It's exactly what we're doing. Now, the last couple verses, I'm not really going to, there's not a whole lot we can say here. John is just making a transition here from his second epistle to his third epistle. So what we're doing now is leaving the area or this arena where devout believers are encouraged to take a stand against false doctrine and apostate teachers and proceed to a different battleground where missionary-minded saints are commended for the fidelity to the cause and arrogant self-seekers are exposed for their treachery and foolish chatter against anyone who expresses any opinion or espouses any cause except their own. So the transition here takes us from the second epistle of John written to this chosen or elect lady whom he loved in the truth to the third epistle written to his beloved Gaius. And uh, in two weeks, we will start into that. Pastor Ron, next Sunday, is going to preach on, uh, I believe, the, the uh, church and, um, and the Jews. The connection between the church and the Jews. And this is something we really need to understand. We, we really need to understand, you know, during this age, there have been thousands and thousands of Jews who have converted from Judaism, per se, to Christianity. And they have been welcomed in as, into the body of Christ, the, the, uh, the bride of Christ, the universal church. But they, have, they still have that special place in the heart of Jesus Christ, of, of the Lord. They are his chosen people. And once the, once the church is taken out of this world and the, the world is plunged into seven years of tribulation, the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, energized and powered by Satan, will hoodwink the whole world into thinking that they are the true, that he is the true Messiah. And uh, the Jews are not, the Jews are gonna, they're gonna be tricked at first. They're gonna sign a non-aggression treaty with this future leader. We find in Daniel 9, 27, it says the people of the prince that shall come and uh, the people that conquered, um, the Jews back 2,000 years ago were the Romans. So he is a man who comes out of that old Roman Empire. And he's going to trick the Jews into signing a seven-year non-aggression non -aggression treaty. And then, and going to claim to be their Messiah. But at the middle part of the tribulation period, when he enters into the temple area, the Holy of Holies, and slaughters a swine on that altar and desecrates it, the Jews are going to realize right then and there that they were hoodwinked, they were lied to. This is not their Messiah. Their Messiah would never commit a sacrilegious act like that. But then it's going to be too late and so they have to flee for their lives. And many believe they will flee to this area in Jordan which is called Petra. And it's a, it's a very uh, natural fortification. And uh, when Antichrist sends his hordes to follow after them, to annihilate them, it says the earth opens up and swallows them like a flood. And uh, God will once again preserve his people. So that's all in the future. For us right now, our, our uh, mission is to continue to occupy till our Lord comes at the rapture to take his bride, his church, out of this world. And that's, that's all we can do. We can just keep preaching and teaching the word 
and uh, leave the results to the Holy Spirit. And uh, when that last soul is saved, that fills the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, when it's complete, the Father will tell the Son, go. And we read that in 2 Thessalonians where it says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up with him to meet in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're looking for the shout to take us out. And praise the Lord, I believe his, his uh, coming is very, very soon. All right, that's it for this week. I trust you've been encouraged and challenged by these words this morning. I certainly have been as I have prepared for this message to deliver it to you. Well, that's all then for this week. And as I said, next week, my dear brother, Reverend Ron Welsh will be in the pulpit here sharing the truths of the word that God has laid upon his heart. So, Lord willing, we will see you again in two weeks. In two weeks. In the meantime, keep looking up, keep encouraging and exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. All right, goodbye for now. And we hope to see you then in two weeks, Lord willing. God bless you. Goodbye.